So now the big question is, now where's the capital in all of that? How do investors think about it? And before we get into a lively panel discussion, Nick McCoy of Whipstitch Capital will give us a brief marker overview for regenerative agriculture and supply. Next slide. And here I am very excited to welcome our friend, partner, and also food funded advisor, Nick McCoy on the virtual stage. Thank you for aggregating some helpful numbers during this state of the industry session. So this will be kind of like a high level session before we dive into a, the final panel discussion. And Nick has more than 20 years of investment banking experience. He's a co-founder and managing director, director of Whipstitch Capital, the largest independent investment bank in the US solely focused on the better for you consumer sector. So with all of the brands that are, you know, and companies that are starting up, I know the question comes up, you know, where do we get funded? And, you know, historically there's been, uh, you know, if you go back 10, 20 years in the sector, there's been kind of a path of, you know, individuals and then kind of small funds and, and brands getting bought at, you know, some level at initially even 10 million or so 10 years ago. And that number has gone up a lot um, as, you know, brands have gotten larger and big CPGs are buying at later points. The question is, how do you get from here to there? And we're always trying to figure out new sources of funding um, that are you know, helpful in, in moving brands along to augment what's already out there and help kind of keep that flow of, of money uh, funding innovation in our sector. So one thing that's really caught my eye and it was anecdotal at first and then I found the numbers behind it is how much more money has gone into ESG funds. ESG stands for environmental social governance but they're also known as kind of double or triple bottom line funds. And if you look at the chart on the left, those are basically Morningstar net inflow numbers. So this is the amount of money net that is going into funds. These funds are generally ones that are investing in public companies, but anecdotally, we're seeing the same trends coming into private equity and venture funds in our sector. Um, and uh, as well as larger funds, which may not be ESG funds, but will allocate a portion of their fund toward that theme. And one of the reasons why you're seeing this accelerate is the chart on the right. And that is that the companies in the S&P 500 that have better environmental, social, and governance are outperforming the others, which is a great sign. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so when, when I think about what is, what is going to make the most impact in society, you know, right now, a lot of impact is, being, is basically relying on tax subsidies or tax-driven subsidies and charitable giving. And if we can actually use investments as the greatest, as a source of capital, we can move things much more quickly. And what I mean by that is if you're an investor and you're going to invest in one asset, which has a 2% return, let's say, in a certain risk level, or another one with a 2% return in the same risk level, and one of them can do good, well, you're going to err toward that one. And essentially, if you look at how much money are we talking about being available, well, to think about taxes, state of Massachusetts is a great proxy because they actually have something on your income tax return where you can check a box and voluntarily pay the old higher rate. It's not very popular. It's about $250,000 a year, which is you know, cents per person. Um, so you can see what the general public sentiment about paying more taxes is. It's not high. Uh, as far as charitable dollars, that's a lot more. Our country is $450 billion a year in donations. That's about $1,371 a person. Much more money, but if we want to accelerate impact, we certainly want as much as possible. So then you look at how much money is out there for investments. Our country has $150 trillion in investments. That is that is more than $450,000 per person. So basically that is a much, much bigger sum, orders of magnitude higher than what's available in charity if we can find investment cases where things can, where impact can be made and a return can be made at the same time. And we're seeing that happening already in our industry with partnerships in the supply chain and things we'll talk about in a minute. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so. Our industry actually has the most potential to make impact because we're actually one of the biggest polluting in industries. As a lot of you probably know these stats, 25% of global emissions are coming out of the food industry. And in the chart on the right, you can see on a net income per ton of emissions, this is not something that gets solved with our own margins. The agriculture, the agriculture sector is not making enough money to essentially solve this problem alone. And so that's where brands, retailers, and you know, basically other things that are gonna preserve our arable land come into play. Next slide, please. So if, if we can just focus on sustaining arable land first, 
when you think about it, well, one of the factors in doing so is creating far, farmer, creating an economic model for farmers that works. And right now we're seeing a lot of softness in smaller farms. Well, if there's an economic model through conversion to uh, regenerative, regenerative organic, um, you know, both, then the farms can actually sustain themselves if there's the demand on the other side. So how much is this worth? Well, you know, one day I actually sat and I, I created a model to figure this out. How much is an, is an acre of arable land worth? So first I started by looking at what's out there for world GDP forecasts, the agriculture market forecast. And one thing that's really interesting is our country has 11 and percent of the arable land in the world today, and we're forecast to have 4% of the population. So that puts us in a position down the road when our population approaches the peak that the globe can feed on its arable land of being the biggest exporter of food in the world. A great position to be in, especially when you think about things like oil and other things which are finite exports uh, that other countries enjoy now. You know, this is something here that goes on in perpetuity. So when you do all that math, you figure out agriculture today is 5.5% of our GDP, and it's going to go up to 8.3% if we don't even account for increases in food prices based on the scarcity when we have a peak population. So one of the really neat things about this is, you know, anybody who's taken an economics class knows by class number three, you've already heard about our trade deficit. And, you know, some, some people say it's bad, some people say it's neutral, nobody says it's good. Um, but our trade deficit right now is three and a half percent of GDP. And if you think about agriculture at 8.3, and the fact that based on the 11.5% and the four, two thirds of our food is going to be exported in that time, that's 5.4% out of the 8.3. That pushes our deficit into a positive. That's a really neat thing. So if we did nothing right now, but just preserve our arable land, we're gonna balance our trade deficit. And that's, that's important economically for this country. It's a great rationale for policy change looking at this. Next slide, please. Another great rationale is, what is, the, what is the benefit to the P&L of the government, basically, of keeping this land? Well, 17% of GDP comes in the form of federal taxes. That's a pretty constant number. So you can look out and you can actually create a model, which I did, which shows if you think about what is the agriculture market per acre of land in the year 2100, when we have basically something approaching a peak population, and what is that worth in the value of incremental taxes compared to if we didn't have that land, and you look at what you get all, all the years till then and what it costs to borrow money today at constant maturity treasuries, you basically come up with a way that without, in, without having to raise taxes, just by issuing treasuries, just like you would do to build a bridge or an airport or any other infrastructure, basically think of our arable land as a key piece of infrastructure in the country because it's not thought about that way. And we did, and we basically issued that debt today to pay for what it would take if we could identify which acres we're going to lose and sustain them by creating an economic model for them that works or helping them get there, it's worth about at a 2% assumption, $35,000 an acre and at 1%, 93,000. The 30 year average is 0.91%. The last 10 years have been closer to 1.2. But any way you slice it, you know, we're talking about numbers that are pretty, pretty astounding for the value of land today. If you could take 10,000 an acre, you've got a lot of cushion in this model. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, we're already seeing that farmland value is increasing fa uh, faster than inflation. There's a finite amount of it. You know, investors are looking at the future. They know that the value of this land is gonna go up when the value of the product goes up. And you're seeing that in the numbers here. Next slide, please. Yep. So this, uh, here's some data that we found. This is actually out of the Ag Census. It's actually one of the best documents out there. It's about 800 pages on uh, you know, the, the agriculture website for the government. And uh, you can see clearly in there that when you look at the farms, the farms that are hurting the most right now are those with kind of 2000 acres or less. Um, the one through 10 acres uh, actually is doing okay comparatively. Um, I think they're small niche farms. But with, so if we're thinking about how can we make a difference in brands and how can we lock in a kind of sustainable mission in our brand early on, where it's going to, in the long term, kind of have the most value. Think about brands like Ben and Jerry's. You know, they will always be known as a sustainable brand because they adopted it early on. Or Stonyfield. You know, nobody will ever not know Stonyfield is organic. Um, even back when they started, organic was just an infancy. But by bringing in a sustainable, you know, mission into your brand early on, it benefits long term. And when you think about selling in 2025 or 30, and people are looking at 10 years out 
what is your brand going to be compared to the big brands in a big CPG portfolio? That is a piece of real estate that they can't duplicate. So how can we do it? Well, we're seeing a lot of things right now, like brands partnering with farms in their supply chain. Because if you have, say, oats or sugar or something like that, that can come from a farm that grows you know, regenerative organic or organic, that farm is putting more carbon in the soil by doing that. It's, it's also giving that farm the demand side of the equation it needs so that it can take the leap and make that conversion and do it with the confidence that it's going to have a product to sell on the other side. Farmers don't wanna have subsidies. They wanna make a product that people wanna buy for what it's worth. And more and more we're seeing people partnering more closely you know, to do that. So th thank you so much and, and on to the panel. Awesome. Thanks so much for, for all the insights. Nick, I saw a lot of people in the audience actually taking photos of some of the slides that you're sharing. So um, this is like a really nice framing.